I want to introduce um, Dr. Uh, Dr. John Doyle. Um, he's going to give our first lecture. Um, Dr. Doyle is um, a uh, in the anesthesiology department of Cleveland Clin Clinic in uh, Ohio, Cleveland, Ohio. He's also a professor of anesthesiology at Cleveland Clinic Learner College of Medicine at Case Western University up in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, he received his um, medical degree in 1982, um, PhD in biomedical engineering in 1986. Um, from the University of Toronto in Canada. He received his Canadian board certifi certification and his, also an American certification in anesthesia. Um, he has a long-standing interest in um, uh, ENT anesthesia, difficult airway management, um, as well as an interest in the use of uh, technology and medicine. Um, his research is supported by a number of funding agencies who holds positions on a number of editorial boards. Dr. Doyle is past president um, of the Society for Airway Management um, and the Society for Technology and Anesthesia, and he's re Clinton, uh, received many clinical teaching awards um, also. So welcome, Dr. Doyle. And thank you, Barbara. So I wanna thank everybody for the opportunity to present on a topic that is definitely in evolution as we understand more, it's molecular mechanisms of anesthesia. And the central message here is that general anesthetics were once believed to be drugs without receptors, and this view is now being abandoned. It is now known that different molecular targets in the central nervous system are involved in general anesthesia, and these targets can vary with different anesthetic agents. And that's the key message. Everything else I have to say is icing on the cake, more elaboration. Historically, a good place to start is with nitrous oxide in the um, middle 1800s, uh, and then diethyl ether came to the anesthetic forefront, first used clinically in 1842, first demonstrated publicly in 1846, and the public demonstration of ether anesthesia is commemorated here in the ether dome, now a national historic site in the United States. And as you can see, you have a whole crowd of surgeons and uh, medical students and others watching one of the first uses of anesthesia uh, for a public demonstration to remove a mass from a neck. Another anesthetic agent that was around the time uh, was 18, uh, in 1847, chloroform was used uh, as an anesthetic during childbirth, but it was later discontinued as its toxicity became apparent, particularly its ventricular irritability and its predisposition to cause cardiac arrest. We now know that there are five main pillars to anesthesia, sedation, unconsciousness, immobility, amnesia, and for many, a muscle relaxation uh, and lack of pain are sometimes included in this, depending on how you like to categorize it. But these are primarily the components of the anesthetized state, what your goals are in providing anesthesia. Not all goals are equally important depending on the clinical situation. There's an interesting review article uh, aimed at the uh, uh, scientific lay press called uh, Lifting the Fog Around Anesthesia from Dr. Beverly Orser. And what's interesting is that she was one of the uh, residents in my cohort when I was doing residency. And she offers this excellent article from Scientific American. And I'm going to go through some of the material uh, that she herself in her laboratory has established, as well as material from another of other investigators. And it's been found that anesthesia drugs dampen neuronal transmission in part by enhancing the effects of the neurotransmitter GABA, a signaling molecule that inhibits nerve, fires, uh, nerve cells from firing. Uh, we also know that uh, other receptors may be involved and we'll have a chance to talk about that as well. Since um, the early days of anesthesia, a number of anesthetic agents have become available and we often characterize them by their minimum alveolar concentration or ED50, uh, where 50% of patients do not respond to a standardized really surgical know. stimulus. Um, so here we go from halothane with a MAC concentration of 0.75% all the way to nitrous oxide, which requires hyperbaric conditions actually for uh, establishing that uh, it would be fully efficacious um, as long as you're going to add some oxygen to it. Uh, so nitrous oxide never really did well as an agent by itself, but until recent years used ubiquitously in, uh, as an adjunct to anesthesia in, in conjunction with other things. Here is 
the relationship between the human minimum alveolar concentration and the effective dose in mice. And you can see that it seems that these um, various drugs are equally efficacious in humans and mice underlying a similar molecular mechanism. And they go all the way from a methoxyfluorine, which is a very low MAC of 0.13, all the way up to nitrous oxide with a MAC of over 100. We do know that the uh, minimum alveolar concentration, uh, for, in this case for halothane, um, but also for nitrous oxide, varies with age. And as you can see, uh, the older that you get after around age 30, the uh, less concentration is needed for uh, achieving our clinical goals. And this is part of how we titrate our anesthesia. The properties of an inhaled, uh, inhaled anesthetic are important. Initially, it often causes excitement. Uh, the patient is intoxicated just with, as with ethanol. And in fact, when people were given ether in public demonstrations, they would behave excitedly and do uh, crazy things uh, until they got into deeper anesthesia, in which case they would just lie down uh, and be unconscious. Higher uh, doses can suppress movement, uh, response to toxic stimulation, and even higher, you get mild cardiac contractility uh, being decreased, vasodilatation, drops in blood pressure, and even uh, apnea. Uh, and so we're aware of these things in everyday life clinically, and we mitigate many of these things, such as, for example, by ventilating the patient and giving uh, volume uh, in the case of vasodilatation. One question is, what is anesthesia? And I'll have a comment about uh, this coming up that's very intriguing. Um, but the response to noxious stimuli can be somatic or autonomic. And if it's somatic, it can be sensory or motor. And the motor response that we're familiar with uh, is movement. And we want an immobile patient for uh, surgery, of course. And muscle relaxants play a role there. In the case of autonomic responses, we can have effects that are hemodynamic, humoral, and the stress response to uh, surgical stimuli is something that's very, very important as we're now looking at ways of decreasing the inflammatory response during surgical procedures. So many aspects are shown here and many kinds of uh, research programs are in place to understand this in more detail. Here is another slide again from uh, Dr. Schaefer showing the various interactions between a local anesthetic, spinal opioids, systemic opioids, and hypnotics, and how they affect the cortex, the midbrain, the thalamus, and the various projections that occur from the midbrain um, to the cortex, uh, and so on. So this is part of the neurophysiology and neuroanatomy uh, of anesthesia. It's very much involved in the neurosciences. So here is a comment from over 25 years ago, that still is applicable to this day. It's, it's from anesthesia and analgesia, and I call it food for thought. General anesthesia is neither general, nor is it anesthesia, that is the absence of sensation. Under general anesthesia, the nervous system continues to be bombarded by nociceptive input. Although central transmission may be diminished, the body is not rendered senseless. Nociceptive afferent stimuli reach the spinal cord and higher centers, and the nervous system responds with reflex movement, autonomic responses, and neurohumoral responses, and by establishing a hyper-excitable state or wind-up. This is not anesthesia, the lack of feeling, because the nervous system is responding to pain. There's nothing general about it. It is rather limited. So what is general anesthesia if it's not the insensibility to pain? The truth is that we do not know exactly what we mean when we speak of general anesthesia. It is ambiguous. We have a much better idea what general anesthesia is not. And this highlights the central challenge that we have in understanding the neurophysiology and neuroanatomy and neuropharmacology of general anesthesia as these various issues are sorted out. Let's begin by looking at some of the neural mechanisms of anesthesia. And for uh, people interested in more details, this is a book a little bit old now on neural mechanisms anesthesia published by Humana Press. And it's not my goal to go through the various pathways that are involved in the various neural structures involved uh, because we have limited time here. But I would uh, bring to your attention this article from Anesthesiology 2007, The Search for Structures and Mechanisms Controlling Anesthesia-Induced Unconsciousness. And although this is some 14 years old, uh, it still gives you a good idea of the complexity of the problem that we're dealing with and the fact that drugs may operate at various levels 
through various different mechanisms. So there's a lot of interest in this and it's very, very complicated. We do know though, uh, that there are a lot of interesting issues that have been identified. For example, we know where anesthesia works in some cases, just not exactly how. And here's just two studies. The top one, thiopental produces immobility primarily via supraspinal action in rats. And in the second one, propofol reduces spinal motor neuron excitability in humans. So the spinal cord is involved in immobility and various other aspects of the pillars of anesthesia I talked about later work in various different parts of the brain. Here's something that's more recent from 2021 from anesthesia and analgesia just a couple of months ago. We know that neural circuits underlying general anesthesia and sleep have some similarities. And here's a quote from that article. Sleep is primarily driven by withdrawal of subcortical excitation of the cortex, but anesthetics can directly act at both subcortical and cortical targets. It is likely that each class of anesthetic drug produces a distinct combination of subcortical and cortical effects that lead to unconsciousness. So there may be more than one pathway to unconsciousness mediated by various pathways and various receptors by virtue of various molecular structures of the agents that we use. They go on to say, modern neuroscience techniques that enable the manipulation of specific neural circuits have led to new insights into the neural circuitry undergoing underlying general anesthesia and sleep. In the coming years, we will continue to better understand the mechanisms that generate these distinct states of reversible unconsciousness. So there is this connection between sleep and general anesthesia that's now being clarified. And there may be understanding common pathways involved as well as understanding how anesthesia disorders and sleep disorders may have some common issues. Here's another comment. Recently, a new genetic technique of tracking, targeting, and stimulating specific neural populations has allowed the targeting of specific behavior-associated brain, uh, brain loci, including anesthesia-activated neurons located in the hypothalamus. So now it looks like the hypothalamus and various interactions, molecular interactions with the, uh, uh, with the various receptors there plays an important role in understanding general anesthesia. And here is another article which you might find interesting, and it's from 2017, around five years ago. Bottom-up and top-down mechanisms of general anesthetics modulate different dimensions of consciousness. So a quote here is that there has been controversy regarding the precise mechanisms of anesthetic-induced unconsciousness with two approaches that have emerged within systems neuroscience. One prominent approach is the bottom-up paradigm, which argues that anesthetics suppress consciousness by modulating sleep-wake nuclei and neural circuits in the brainstem and diencephalon that have evolved to control arousal states. Another approach is the top-down paradigm, which argues that anesthetics suppress consciousness by modulating the cortical and thalamocortical circuits involved in the integration of neural information. So these are two approaches that are being actively investigated by researchers. And if you uh, follow their literature on this, you'll get more information. Another interesting development concerns that of anesthetic emergence. Here's a quote. Once assumed to be a purely passive process, spontaneously occurring as a result, uh, as uh, residual levels of anesthetics dwindle below critical value, emergence from general anesthesia has been reconsidered as an active and controllable process. Emergence is driven by mechanisms that can be distinct from entry into the anesthetized state. So it's not simply that you wake up because the anesthesia wears off. It's more complicated than that. And to show that it's more complicated, here's another article, which essentially shows that uh, D-amphetamine induces emergence from sevoforin and propofol anesthesia in rats. So it's more complicated than we thought. It's not simply wearing off from the anesthesia. And as you can see, look at all the various molecular structures in contemporary and historical general anesthetics. How is it that they all seem to work, and yet they're all so different in their molecular structure? Well, here's a list of the various anesthetics uh, used in clinical practice, starting off with nitrous oxide and ether in the 1840s, chloroform later on, all the way up to desflurane and sevoforin that we use contemporaneously. And uh, what we can see for this is that if you plot 
the potency of the anesthetic drug against the oil gas partition coefficient for olive oil, you have a linear relationship that's shown here. So that the stronger the oil gas um, partition coefficient, the lower the potency of the anesthetic agent and the, um, the lower the oil gas uh, uh, partition coefficient, the higher the potency the drug is. So let's take a look here. We have MAC uh, or ED50 in animals uh, on the vertical axis, and we have the oil gas partition coefficient uh, going from strong to weak. And you can see that there's this inverse linear relationship. And this has led some people to wonder if the molecular mechanisms might be occurring at the level of the cell membrane, which uh, absorb uh, the uh, olive oil um, in this manner. So we have the uh, cell membrane uh, with hydrophobic fatty acid tails and polar head groups in this phospholipid bilayer. And inside this bilayer, you have all of these protein channels and other structures. And through these protein channels, ions may pass and other molecules. So we know that the cell membrane may be important, particularly in transporting molecules and particularly in transporting ions from inside to out and outside to in. And so this led to the development of the Meyerton overton rule uh, leading to the critical volume hypothesis that the absorption of anesthetic molecules in this lipid bilayer could expand the volume of hydrophobic uh, uh, regions within the cell membrane and distort the channels necessary for sodium ion flux. Uh, and so that uh, has been around for a while as a hypothesis. And you can see here this model where the anesthetic molecules with different molecular volumes will distort the lipid uh, bilayer in a way that reversibly alters the function of the membrane ion channels, providing an anesthetic effect. So I'm calling this model one of anesthesia, and I'm going to expose you to five different models, uh, including one which is the more popular one today. A second variation of this uh, model two here, the modern lipid hypothesis, is that general anesthetics change the membrane lateral pressure profiles which det uh, determine the conformation of uh, membrane-bound ion channels, shown here as a green lock. So it's all about the ion channels and the effect of general anesthesia on locking them or locking them. And according to this, you can have a well-ordered lipid cholesterol ring around the gap junction uh, that maintains an open gap junction, but with uh, anesthetic molecules being introduced, shown in the red triangles, you have closure of this connection. And that's the hypothesis uh, that has been offered in this particular setting. But it turns out there are problems with this membrane model. General anesthetics were found to have no effect on lipid bilayer structures when studied using X-ray crystallography and neutron diffraction. Combined gaseous and aqueous phase solubility data suggested that the primary state of action of general anesthetics has both polar and nonpolar characteristics and probably involves proteins and not the lipid bilayers. Despite their popularity, theories that invoke lipids as the prime target do not look at all promising. This is from this Molecular Mechanisms of General Anesthesia article from Nature in 1982. Structural changes of proteins on binding general anesthetics are probably small, but may be sufficient to perturb normal function. So now we have this uh, set of investigators who are saying that the membrane model is not very good. We have to look at protein changes. So it led to model three, which is now our dominant model. In 1984, they found that two classes of proteins are inactivated by clinical doses of anesthetics in the total absence of lipid, demonstrating that general anesthetics may also interact with hydrophobic protein sites of certain proteins, rather than affect membrane proteins indirectly through nonspecific interactions with the lipid bilayer. So here we see uh, enzyme inhibition for general anesthesia. Uh, and on the top, you can see the degree of uh, enzyme inhibition and on the uh, horizontal axis, the effective concentration for general anesthesia. And you can see that as uh, the effective concentration of general anesthesia increases, you have increasing enzyme inhibition. Uh, and what enzyme was this that they studied? It was luciferase, but there's other enzymes that are of interest. So in this basic study that came out, uh, which revolutionized our understanding of how anesthetics work, uh, the author said 
The obvious mechanism suggested by our results is that general anesthesia, despite their chemical and structural diversity, act by competing with endogenous ligands for binding to specific receptors. So if that's true, what are the endogenous ligands? And so we're going to have a chance to talk about that in a minute, which brings us to receptor theory. The ligands have to bind to receptors. And so just like a lock and a key match together to open uh, a door, uh, we have molecules that match a receptor to activate a pathway. We know that there are a number of receptor family types uh, and of interest for us primarily is number two, the G protein activation process, which results in the generation of a second messenger, as well as the activation of cell signaling. But it's worthwhile knowing that there are other kinds of receptors that work uh, through, uh, in many cases, a lipid bilayer, uh, but the G protein activation process is one that we're most familiar with. And here we can see an example of this with the NMDA receptor. It's one of the main receptors and one me mediators of excitatory neurotransmissions. This is for excitatory neurotransmitters. The binding of both glutamate and glycine activates the receptor. And it's the ligon gated ion channel permitting the movement of calcium, sodium, and potassium across the postsynaptic membrane. Okay, so that's the NMDA receptor. And Ketamine is an NMDA receptor agonist, and at high doses, it also binds to opioid mu and sigma receptors. But if you want to know how ketamine works, in part of it is its relationship to the NMDA receptor as an antagonist. And it turns out that xenon, as well as isoflurane, act at the glycine binding site of the NMDA receptor to achieve its goal. Remember, again, this is... Um, an excitatory receptor, which um, is inactivated by xenon and by isoflurane. Another receptor, and this one's even more important, is the GABA-A receptor. These are classes of receptors that respond uh, to GABA, two classes, GABA-A and GABA-B, of which the GABA-A is somewhat more important. And GABA-A is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. It helps maintain overall balance to the nervous system by dampening neurons' ability to respond to excitatory messages from other cells. And so for that reason, GABA is thought to play a central role in the actions of anesthetic drugs. So this is an inhibitory neurotransmitter, whereas we saw uh, earlier that there were excitatory neurotransmitters. So here is a schematic diagram, again, from Bev Orser's 2007 article from Scientific American, showing how you have GABA being released from the synapse binding to uh, GABA receptors. And uh, it says an electrical pulse in the membrane of one neuron provokes the release of GABA into the synapse. The molecules cross a small gap, bind to the GABA receptors on the postsynaptic cell. And in some cases, there can be found outside the synapse along the nerve body, and they can be activated by GABA that spills out of the synapse. So the existence of uh, extra synaptic GABA receptors is something that is interesting and people are trying to find out the clinical significance of that. The GABA-A receptor is a protein complex with five subunits and two alpha subunits, two betas and one gamma and the molecular structure is shown in schematic form here. And some more quotes, most postsynaptic receptors on cells that interact with gamma belong to a class termed ligand-gated ion channels, as I mentioned earlier, and increased ion channels uh, concentration generates a negative potential, preventing the cell from being able to produce an excitatory electrical impulse, jamming the pathways. So uh, here's another schematic diagram showing the receptor units in the GABA-A receptor and where GABA, -A, uh, GABA would normally bind to. And then you have an anesthetic molecule binding to the uh, GABA-A receptor subunit causing a hyperpolarized cell membrane. And this is a schematic diagram showing how hyperpolarization of the cell membrane prevents it from neurotransmission. Now I wanna close by indicating that there are other models around as well. These have not been fully accepted yet. Um, it turns out that our understanding of GABA receptors and NMDA receptors is doing very well. But here is an article published from the uh, Proceedings of the National Academy of Science from around eight years ago, electron spin changes during general anesthesia and drysophila. Uh, 
And the idea here is that protein changes altered by xenon uh, may be responsible. And they propose that anesthetics perturb electron currents in cells and describe electronic structure calculations on anesthetic protein interactions that are consistent with this mechanism. So there may be something you're doing at the quantum level involving electronic currents in cells. And this is something they have suggested. That doesn't preclude the possibility that this is an extra step to the uh, receptor model, but uh, it's something that's of active interest. And finally, we have yet another article from anesthesia and analgesia from uh, six years ago. Uh, the mitochondrial hypothesis suggests that yet another mechanism pertaining to anesthesia may exist involves reduction in mitochondrial energy levels. And they looked at this using resonance, uh, magnetic resonance spectroscopy. So that may be uh, involved as well. So we have a number of models uh, of which the receptor-based approach seems to be the one that offers us the best explanation so far. But we also know that there's a lot of active research going on to try and carefully uh, elucidate many of these pathways and molecular mechanisms. We know that no single mechanism explains how general anesthetics work, but the old model of anesthetic agents acting on the lipid bilayer to close off ion channels is now largely discredited. And the current model is that anesthetic agents act on NMDA receptors and especially GABA receptors, depending on the agent studied. Two new models involving electron spin changes in proteins and changes in mitochondrial energetics have recently been proposed. And so the question is, are they going to supplement our understanding? For people wanting more information, there is a number of excellent references and bibliography that I'll show you here. Uh, and if you just go to PubMed and type in the appropriate terms, you'll get way more information. Uh, and that brings us to the end of the discussion. And uh, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to present. And I look forward to answering any of your questions if you have any. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Doyle. That was a wonderful, wonderful lecture. Um, I'm gonna invite all the participants to please put your questions in the chat, the little chat box, and I will um, uh, read them to Dr. Doyle for you. I think there's one question up right now. Let me see what this one is. It says, this is from Muhammad Solomon. Where are we towards personalized anesthesia concept? Uh, we're many years away from it, but I'll re remind you that it took less than seven decades to go from the first flight to landing on the moon. And given that we're understanding the human genome more and more and the molecular mechanisms have some sort of a genetic basis in some ways, uh, it may be that we have a personalized approach uh, that becomes available to us in the future. We already have personalized approaches in the sense that if we know that a patient has a history of malignant hyperthermia susceptibility, we're going to alter our anesthetic techniques for there as well. Uh, and in particular, uh, there could be people who have variations in opioid receptors, for example. Uh, so this is something we might see uh, our grandchildren being involved in. That would be nice. Uh, but certainly, uh, ge ge genomically personalized medicine is something that is happening on all dimensions and could happen to anesthesia as well. Very good. Thank you. Here's another question from Ahmed L. Tawansi. He says, um, can you tell us more about the D-amphetamine theory? Uh, so the idea is that if you give uh, the D-amphetamines uh, to these animals, they will... Um, they will wake up. And so the question is that activate certain pathways that may be actively involved in emergence from anesthesia. Um, some of the older folks here remember that we would use physostigmine to help wake up patients at the end uh, where they didn't wake up that fast. But that was very nonspecific and a lot of them would just sit up and vomit on you. Um, so the, uh, the role of uh, the amphetamines in waking you up from anesthesia is something that is investigational at the time. It's at the moment limited to animal studies, um, but its main value will be determining what pathways are involved and how we might be able to specifically activate that in cases um, 
activate that in, in cases where we want to wake up the patient quickly, just like Sugamidex now can quickly reverse neuromuscular blockade with rocuronium and get us out of the operating room faster. That being said, uh, some of my colleagues would say, well, if you titrate the anesthetic just right, delayed emergence from anesthesia is rarely a problem. So uh, we'll have to see how that one plays out. Very good. Um, here's another question um, from Verhan uh, Kazal. How is normal sleep different from general anesthesia? Uh, well, they're very different uh, in that normal sleep acts primarily on the locus cerealis, uh, and general anesthesia involves multiple other structures, including cortical structures. Uh, and clinically, we know that if you have a patient in normal sleep and you hit them with a scalpel, they'll wake up instantly. In general anesthesia, that's not the case. So although there's some overlapping mechanisms that are being identified, uh, we know now that um, they are very different processes, but they do have some common elements that are being teased out. Um, one of the interesting things for people who do sedation is that when you give dexmedetomidine, which does act on the locus cerealis and elsewhere, uh, it creates a state more akin to natural sleep than some of the other agents like propofol uh, in that they're more easily aroused. And so that's another hint that there may be differences in the molecular underpinnings involved. Thank you. Here's another question from Kadi Shurinavasi Rao. Do you visualize a greater role for nanotechnology in explaining general anesthesia? Uh, I think uh, nanotechnology is simply the understanding of the mechanisms involved with small machines. And all of these molecules are small machines. Nanotechnology is just these small machines, except that they're made by uh, they're made by our genetic apparatus and our synthesis apparatus rather than by humans. Uh, so nanotechnology may, whoops, let me see. Uh, can you hear me okay? I got a, a warning here. Um, I can hear you. Can everyone hear? Uh, it stopped working. Uh, oh, I can still hear you. Hmm. I can hear you overall. I hear you. We still see you, we still hear you. Dr. Doyle, can you hear us? Dr. Doyle, can you hear us? I don't think he hears us. I can hear him. I see him, but I don't, uh, I don't hear him. Uh, somebody says that they can hear me. So even though I can't hear anybody now, I'm not sure what happened. Uh, I will continue on with another question. Uh, the next question was, to what extent do you think that closed loop anesthesia could solve personal variation in the anesthetic response? Uh, and that's a very interesting question because believe it or not, attempts at closed loop anesthesia go back to the 1940s and 50s with the idea that electroencephalographic monitoring of the brain, uh, looking for a suitable amount of delta waves um, could allow them to vary the amount of ether given uh, and so this goes back a, a long time. Now with um, the use of uh, electroencephalographic monitoring, particularly with the BIS technique, um, it's possible that that will uh, be something that happens, but more likely uh, there's sufficient art involved in the administration of anesthesia that it will not be a closed loop process completely. More likely uh, in other countries, uh, the use of pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic models will be useful and um, target controlled infusions are popular in Europe and the rest of the world, but uh, you may be surprised to find that target controlled infusions based on pharmacokinetics and dynamics are not available in the United States. They have not been approved by the FDA. Now, I can't hear anything more, unfortunately. Okay. Um, Good. <laughs> So I'm going to, uh, since I can't hear anything, I'm going to sign out and move on to the uh, next speaker.